I don't know how many of you know photographers, but um, I was a, I am a photographer, but I was a freelance uh, photojournalist for many years, and I was very fortunate. I, I worked for Time Magazine and National Geographic, many publications, and um, I uh, was doing a story uh, many years ago about children who had been fathered by American GIs. And uh, I decided to six children in different countries and sort of tell the story of their lives, of, of what it was like to be uh, abandoned. Uh, there are 40,000 uh, children uh, every year basically abandoned in Southeast Asia. Uh, wherever uh, the United States, wherever there are military troops anywhere in the world, basically there are children that are the result of it. The American government basically says these are the children of uh, uh, wanton women. And the, uh, the local governments tend to say these are the children of American GIs. And these kids are left in the middle. One of the children I started photographing was a little girl uh, named Unsuk who lived in a small village. This little girl was being raised by her grandmother in a small village up along the DMZ. This, uh, this little girl was being raised by her grandmother. And the moment I met her, I could tell right away there was something different about this child because most of the children that I had photographed uh, were almost like concentration camp victims. They wouldn't look you in the eye. They were incredibly timid. They were hunched over. This little girl and the grandmother had this very special relationship. It was really, I'd never seen anything quite like it. The girl didn't seem at all to be uh, aware of how different she looked than the other children in the village. She seemed to be very popular. And I made a deal with her. Uh, I went with my translator to the village and I asked if I could spend a week there. I didn't speak a word of Korean. So, um, I asked through my translator if I could sleep in a little hut outside of their house. And uh, I said before my translator left to this little girl, Unsuk, if I ever do anything to embarrass you in any way, just say stop and I'll stop taking pictures. And uh, throughout the week, to delight her girlfriends at school, she would look at me every once in a while and go stop and I would stand at attention and all the kids would crack up. I followed her to school. Uh, this is early morning, getting ready for the, the, the day. and. Um, What's so remarkable about these children is that sometimes they look completely Korean. In this case, she looked completely American. As I said, most of the children I photographed that were Amerasian were very timid and shy, not outgoing, went out of their way to be not looked at. Unsuk was very different. She, when the teachers asked questions, she immediately raised her hand. She was very popular with the other girls. She obviously had very close relationships with the other girls in the village. Um, she was very studious. At uh, recess, she was the girl that was choosing the other kids to be on her team. She was obviously a leader in the, in, uh, amongst these kids. This is walking home uh, after school. And the relationship that she had with the grandmother was just extraordinary. Well, I, I had been there uh, now for a week. My translator came back. I asked her to come back at the end of this week. And uh, I started to say thank you to the grandmother. And throughout the week, the little girl went so started holding my hand on the way to school. And it was really touching. And I, I was... Uh, I was 27 years old at the time, and uh, it was just sort of cool to have this little kid, you know, who seemed to like me, and um, I was getting ready to leave. I sat down with the grandmother, just with the translator to say thank you, and the grandmother started crying. And I said to the translator, uh, oh my gosh, did, did I do something wrong? And the translator talks to the grandmother, and the translator starts crying. I said, uh, could, what's going on here? And the translator said, um, all of her life, um, the grandmother's been telling Unsuk that someday her father will come back for her. And the whole week you've been here, um, the grandmother hasn't heart, had the heart to tell her that you're not her father. And, uh, I, you know, all of a sudden, there's all the pieces sort of clicked into place. And I, I suddenly understood why she was showing me off to the other girls. And, and, and then she told me, the grandmother said she was dying. And she wanted to know if I would take Unsuk with me to America and adopt her. And, you know, my, I, I immediately said, you know, I'm not married. I'm immature. I sleep on my sister's couch in New York. Um, I don't even have a girlfriend. Um, um, <laughs> And, another, never, and I also said, can I take you to the hospital? Can I, can I, you know, what's wrong? Why do you think you're dying? And I, and I didn't know if I was being played because you've heard, you, there are lots of stories of, of, you know, people in this situation trying to find someone to sort of give them money. But I felt the, gen, the grandmother was quite genuine. And I said, if she was serious, I would try to find a family for Unsuk, but that I, I couldn't adopt her. And I gave her my business card. And I wasn't really 100% sure this was really happening, but, I, but I, I felt like I'd given her my word. So I immediately wrote... I left Korea and I wrote to my best friend, who some of you know as Jean Driscoll, who's been photographing all of you this week. And um, I said, you know, Jean, you haven't heard from me in six months. I've been just finished doing the story for National Geographic. I'm doing about, about page um, seven of a 20-page letter. I said, oh, by the way, I met this little girl. And um, I remember you once mentioning that um, Jean had an 11-year-old son at the time. Jean was the opposite of me. Jean was, Sandy's my little brother. Jean was the big brother I always wanted. I was the, the eldest of three children. I always wanted somebody to put their arm around me and say, kid, this is how you do it, you know. Um, 
So I called my pseudo big brother and uh, Gene and his wife astoundingly, without even asking for a picture of her, said, okay. And then I went, well, wait a second. I, I, I need to go back and talk to the grandmother because this is all moving a little too fast. I'm not really sure the grandmother really wants to do this. So um, I was going to go back to Korea right after Christmas. And on Christmas Day, I was in Bangkok, a group of photographers sitting at Christmas dinner. And a guy came down from the front desk and said, is there a small in here? And I raised my hand. And they handed me a telegram. And it said, someone in Korea has died and left you a child in their will. Do you know anything about this? I had never told time what I was doing. Um, so I went back to Korea. And uh, I tried to find her. And I went to the villa. I went to the house where, the, where she lived. The house was empty. None of the villagers would tell me where she was. Um, finally, a little girl that, I had, that, she, that she played with after school every day, I went to this little girl and I said, look, you know, you saw me here before, you know that Unsuk liked me, we're trying to find her, nobody will tell us where she is, and she very quietly gave us um, an address on the outside of Seoul. So I went with my translator, we knocked on the door of this house, and Unsuk opens the door, her eyes are completely bloodshot, doesn't recognize me at all, just like, like a zombie. A man comes to the door and sort of starts barking at us, really like yelling. And I said to the translator, well, what is he saying? And he wants to know who you are. I said, well, tell him I'm a photographer. And she starts talking and he interrupts her. And she said, he kn says he knows who you are and he wants you to go away. And I said, well, ask him who he is. And she said, he's her uncle. And, I, and, and he says that he wants her to leave. And I said, look, tell him I've come a very long way. It's, this is like bitterly cold in the middle of like January in Korea. It's 20 below zero or something. So I, I said, would you tell him that I've come a very long way? I'm very cold. I'd like to come inside just for one moment. And so he very reluctantly let us inside. And as, he, as we came inside, I saw that uh, he had uh, Unsuk bringing food out and taking care of his baby. And it, 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 it was, to me, it looked like Cinderella. It was like this, this happy little girl who had all these friends suddenly was in this sort of horrible little slum on the outside of Seoul. And um, I asked him if I could have some tea. And we sat down. And uh, in talking, I said, look, I, I promised this little girl's um, a grandmother, I would find a family for her, and I have. And he said, well, I'm her uncle. I'm the eldest male in my family. She's fine. You can leave now. And I remember thinking, like, you know, if this was a movie or something, what would the hero do? Because I, I knew the moment I walked out of the door, this whole thing was over. So um, I changed the conversation. I started asking about himself. I find when people are getting aggressive with you, if you start asking them um, personal questions, sometimes it sort of takes them off the main topic. And I asked him if he'd studied English, and he, he loosened up a little bit. And I said, look, I'm stuck here for a week. I'm so glad, by the way. I said, look, I'm so happy you're going to take care of her. I just wanted to make sure she had a roof over her head and somebody's looking after her. I said, you seem like a great guy, right? Uh, <laughs> and I said, look, I'm here for a week because I bought a ticket. And I said, would you like to come to my hotel? And tomorrow you can practice English, and, uh, you know, I'm staying at a nice hotel downtown. So he came downtown, and I found two older Amerasian children I'd photographed, uh, a girl who was a prostitute. She was in her 20s. Uh, and a boy who um, was, had been in and out of jail. And um, I said, look, there's a little girl who has a tiny, tiny hope of getting out of here. And I said, you know, it's too late for you guys. I mean, one, once you're past like 13, you can't be adopted. I said, but um, I want you to tell the uncle what people say to you when you walk down the street, what it's like to be an Amerasian here. And uh, so he came to, to lunch not realizing he was about to be mugged. Um, and they just lit into this guy. I don't know what they said. Within about three minutes, we got thrown out of the restaurant at the hotel. They were shouting at him. He was completely red-faced. We went outside. He started screaming at me, and I, I realized I had completely blown this whole thing, and I said to the translator, you know, what's he saying now? And she said, he says, how dare you walk into my house with your cameras around your neck? You're some rich American with your, you know, walking here wanting to whisk this beautiful little girl away and know nothing about you, and you're accusing me of enslaving my own niece? Like, who the hell are you? And I said, look, you know, I, I, I'm really sorry for jumping to conclusions, but I said, I've been photographing these children all over Asia. It's a terrible thing that my countrymen have done. We've left these children behind. And I said, I've found a wonderful family for her in, in Atlanta. And I said, you know, is she going to go to school if she stays with you? And he said, no. He said, but don't, he said, don't children help in, in America? Don't they help clean up their, the homes? Don't they make tea and take care of the babies? And I said, well... Actually, probably should do more of that than they do. But I, I, I somehow convinced him that this, that this girl was going to be more of a burden and a problem. And I also said, look, you know, as much as you may love her, um, everything I've seen right now in Korea, and I understand today it's different in 2010 than it was when I did the story, but I said everything I've seen is that no matter how much you may love her, that your society is very unforgiving. There's a tremendous amount of racism against these kids that are, that are mixed blood. So um, he invited me to the funeral that was happening the next day. Um, and it was just so, it was just broke my heart to see her. She was just completely so miserable and so missing the grandmother. 
Um, this is the same child you saw three months earlier, and you can see how much older and sort of harder and, and you know, obviously miserable she is. I had photographed an American Marino priest who was taking care of these children. He had 75 children in his house, a guy named Father Keen. So I suggested the uncle and I go down there because I said, look, I want you to feel comfortable that the American uh, authorities will, you know, uh, uh, interview my friend. And I even offered to fly Gene and his family over to Korea to meet the uncle to make sure he was comfortable with it. This is on the way down to Father Keen's. Um, Father Keen interviewed her in Korean. He spoke Korean fluently. He's one of these priests who would actually go out with the GIs and go to the whorehouses and go to the bars and actually say to the GIs, you know, screw your brains out, but don't get these girls pregnant. These are two children who are unrelated at, at Father Keen's orphanage. The kids just took care of each other. And, you know, my assumption was that it was the, the bad GIs, but he said to me, you know, it's not the bad GIs. He said, some of the girls want to get pregnant because then they hope the whole family will come over. Sometimes it's the bad GIs. He said, you know, let's not, let's not lay blame anywhere. The point is, let's find good families for these children. So Father Keen asked the uncle if she could come and move in with him. Uh, and then Jean was going to be coming over very shortly. So she moved into the orphanage. I went off, I had, did another, another assignment. I came back a week later and Father Keen said, I have to talk to you about Unsuk. And I said, oh, God, what's wrong? He said, just come to my office. So I go in the office, and he says, uh, I've had hundreds of children come through the orphanage. And he said, there's three adults here and 75 children any given time, so you can imagine total, utter bedlam. And he said, within two days, she had made a list of all the older kids and assigned each of the older kids to one of the younger kids. She set up days of who's going to clean which room, and he said, she's running the orphanage. She's been here a week. And he said, I don't know who the grandmother was, but he said, I've never seen a child like this. She also organized movie days on Tuesdays where she'd take all the older girls out for movies. Um, he, Father Keen had a very interesting saying. He said, he said, there's three kinds of children he's seen come through the orphanage. There's glass, plastic, and steel. The, the glass kids, they're so shattered from their experience that they can, no matter how much you love them, there's nothing you can do for them. They're, they're, they're just, they're, they're in pieces. He said, the plastic kids, no matter what happens to them, they're kind of who they are. And he said, the steel kids are the ones, he said, I've only seen one other child like this where the more adversity, the tougher life is, the better they get. And he said, I think that this child is going to have an amazing life. All the children that were adopted right back to the women who were running the orphanage, and the women had children who had gone over to America as well. So the kids would all gather around, and they'd read letters, what, what it was like to go and live in America. So this, Gene started studying Korean, like from the day that I wrote to, to him and Gail, and he did a mural in his kitchen in Korean about a little girl who came from the hills of Korea to live happily ever after in Atlanta. He wrote her a letter telling her he was coming to see her. Here's Jean and the uncle huddled over a dictionary, which is a very frequent sight. Jean showing the uncle where Atlanta, Georgia is. The uncle signing the adoption papers. So this was a very momentous night. We went to a restaurant to celebrate. And uh, Jean had brought his son over, who was also 11 years old. The first night we were in Korea, um, we got the kids, uh, we stayed in my room because I was paying for all this. And the second night we went and stayed at the orphanage with the kids and slept on the floor. And the third night we came back, and this is Jean teaching, uh, she changed her name to Natasha. This is um, Natasha teaching uh, Jean how to use chopsticks. So we went back to our hotel room, Jean was showing her where Atlanta was. It had been really uh, uh, a crazy three days and um, Jean was sleeping in one bed, uh, Unsu, uh, Natasha was sleeping in the other bed, I was on the floor in a sleeping bag and, and his son Tim was next to me and the kids fell asleep and we were laying in the dark and Jean and I were talking about what great guys we were. We were saying, you know, God, we've done this great thing, we saved this little girl's life and we're like heroes and we're so cool and it was like, ah, we're so cool. And we fall asleep and I, throughout the whole month I've been staying in this hotel room before, by myself before Jean came over, I always left that window open in the corner because it was always incredibly hot at night. And every night at 1 o'clock, they turn the heat off in the hotel. So sure enough, 1 o'clock comes. I get up to turn, close the window, and I'm hearing people shouting outside. I thought, you know, the bars must have gotten out or something. And I get back in my sleeping bag, and I suddenly thought, wait a second, there's a, there's a curfew at midnight. There's nobody in the streets in Korea after midnight. It's 1 o'clock. So I, I go out, and I put my glasses on to see what's going on, and there's flames coming up the side of our hotel, and the hotel's on fire. I run over to Gene, and I try to wake him up, and, and I said, don't freak out. <laughs> don't freak out. I said, I think the hotel's on fire. He runs, to the, he runs to the window, and there's flames coming up now, like by our window. There's smoke. There's, and then you're starting to hear screaming, glass breaking, these weird thumps. And um, we run to the, we tried, I remember his son at LL being bootlaces, and we're trying to put these bootlaces on. And we tried to, we woke her up. You know what kids are like when they've been asleep for an hour? Like they took five Valiums, and they're like this, and we, we can't even talk to her. And we run to the door, and it, it's Gene, uh, Tim, 
me and her, and Gene opens the door, and it's like walking into a blast furnace. There's smoke. There's people screaming in the halls. Smoke starts pouring in the room. She's holding onto the doorknob and kicking me, and Gene turns around and pushes us back in the room and says, we're not going to make it, and, and, and we're choking. The whole room is now filled with smoke. I, I'm just scared shitless, and I, I just remember thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening, and the whole room is filled with smoke. Um, I remember Gene's son is lying on the floor. Uh, I can't even see Gene through the smoke. And, and there's this, you can just hear this level of panic rising through the hotel, let alone with us. And Gene says to me, we've got to soak towels. And I said, what? He says, we've got to soak towels. We're going to die from the smoke. So we run in the bathroom and get towels, put them over the kids' faces. Gene said, do you have gaffer's tape? And I, I, can't, I said, we can't even see each other. I had you know, this metallic tape that all photographers travel with. So I said, what? He said, we got it. He said the, the smoke is pouring under the door. It's coming through the vents in the wall. We're going to die from the smoke. I don't know if we're ever going to get out of this fire. I mean, Gene totally saved our lives. So we got the room service menus. We taped up the walls. We put blankets at the bottom of the door. Um, we're all now soaked from these wet towels. We go to the window. And we open the window to try to get some air in the room. Still, there's no fire engines. No one's trying to get us out of the building. It's just unbelievable. This has been going on for like 15 minutes now. And there's people below us that are starting to jump out the windows. And we we'd had the kids on the windowsill to try to get them. So we pull the kids off the windowsill. And um, there's a bottle of Kahlua that he and I start drinking. <laughs> we turn the radio on thinking there'll be a, a report on the air service, the American Air Force Station. And uh, they're playing Chicago's Uptown Woman. And it's like, this is like totally surreal. And the... The, the two emotions I had during this whole thing is that um, um, I've just killed my best friend and his son and this little girl, and here I was playing God, and this is what you get for playing God. The fire engines finally came. Um, they got everybody out. Um, uh, the next day, we went back to her village where we first met her. Um, this is the last night uh, Jean and Tim were in the town. This is uh, four months later. She went to, uh, we were going to the airport, um, she flew to Atlanta. It was like an incredibly long flight. Um, uh, uh, Cathay Pacific um, actually let her sit in the cockpit, and the pilot went back after heard her story and adopted one of the other kids from Father Keens, which is just amazing. Um, Gail was three days away from giving birth to her own daughter. Um, I promised Natasha that she could cut off my beard when we got to Atlanta. Kylie was born three days later. It's her bedroom with the first picture I took of her. She learned English in three months, entered seventh grade at her own age level, um, took the bus to school, first Pledge of Allegiance, decided who was going to be on her team at recess because she just assumed she would be in charge. Um, she's been like this most of her life. Tense moment in the, in the first football game of the season. She just absolutely loved her sister Kylie and Taylor. Baptism. You know, a lot of families when they adopt try to erase their children's past. And Jean and Gail did the opposite. They all bought Korean clothes. They started going to Korean church. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Uh, Natasha's first job, Burger King, which she used to buy a bright red Carmen Ghia. Computer camp, starting water fights. All of her boyfriends were blondes. <laughs> Captain of the cheerleaders, homecoming queen. Jean's annual card. She got hired by uh, Delta Airlines um, and uh, has been a flight attendant for them for many years. We went back to Korea for the first time, um, and uh, there she is with her uncle. It's her wedding day. There's Jean walking his daughter down the aisle. Natasha's uh, sort of, uh, <laughs> she's been more mature than me since the day I met her, and uh, uh, she now has two wonderful children. And that's her husband, Jeff. And that's the last picture. And by the way, I decided the best gift I could ever give Natasha was to never publish her story. She actually wants to actually do a book now together. But um, um, before I did the story, the most important thing in the world to me was getting published. And I realized the best gift I could give her was just to have her life. And uh, I'm grateful to, uh, to Jean for having raised my uh, sort of first daughter. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you very much. Jean, I think you should stand up.